Tonight we're going to explore a little bit about the topic of what is called in Hebrew savlanut or savlanus. And uh, the meaning of the word is important to understand. <clears throat> when you go back to the biblical story of the uh, enslavement of the Israelites in Egypt, so one of the things that God tells Moses when he's announcing that the Israelites are going to be liberated is that God says that he's going to take the people of Israel out from the burdens of Egypt. Mitachat sivlot mitzrayim. He's going to take them out from under the burdens of Egypt. Obviously, when you're working as a slave, that's a tremendous burden. But the word also has the implication of bearing up under that suffering, meaning patiently bearing up with that suffering, putting up with it, carrying it, holding it. So it's not just the, the, the suffering, the uncomfortable experience. That's the idea of Lisbol or Sivlot as sufferings, but also the idea of putting up with that uncomfortable situation. One of the Hasidic Rebbe's, the Ger Rebbe, said that what God was telling Moses is that he was going to free the Israelites from their toleration, from their putting up with their suffering in Egypt. I mean that we speak about savlanut not just as suffering, but as patience. And the problem the Israelites had was that they became very patient. They were putting up with their situation in Egypt. It became their new normal. And so that's not good when you're suffering, especially a suffering that's inappropriate like slavery in Egypt, becomes okay and they tolerate it. So what God is saying is, number one, the suffering, the slavery is going to end. But before that happens, before you become freed physically, you have to become freed emotionally. You have to become freed from the fact that you're not bothered by your, your slavery, that you're putting up with it to the degree where it's okay. Now, that's a very, very radical situation. But the truth is that when we go through our da daily lives, there are a lot of things that we will find annoying. And we suffer from them. They're a little bit painful. And so what happens with savlanut is we have to develop the capability to carry the burden, to suffer with nobility. Not that we're putting up with something that is so horrible that it has to be fought with ten plagues that God sends. So we're going to be looking at this topic of patience tonight. I will say that I myself find this a very challenging uh, mida character trait to, to have to deal with. I usually find myself in many situations to be a very patient person. I can put up with a lot, and yet I find myself, uh, and I'm frustrated by this, very often I, I catch myself being very impatient and, and not being able to carry this burden. So it's something that I think many people over history have had to deal with. It's very easy to become impatient, and I think especially in a modern age, when you think about it, a large part of being patient is waiting, is waiting. And we are living in a world today where everything has been designed to move so quickly that we have a more difficult time to wait, I believe, than maybe generations ago. When I grew up, a television, if you switched it on, it would take a minute or two for it to go on. You'd have to wait until this big white dot appeared in the middle of the screen, and then the big white dot got bigger and bigger. But you turn a television on, and it wouldn't go on right away. You'd have to wait. 
Today, if that happened to someone, right, your blood pressure would shoot all the way up. Um, I remember, probably most of you, when we had a computer that was called a 286 computer. That was the, that was the uh, in, in the early days of computers. Anyone here remember 286? Well, if your computer today ran at that speed, you go out of your mind. Because we become used to, we become very used to things moving very quickly. That becomes normal. That becomes what we expect. And if it moves just a little bit slower, we become very aggravated. And our patience wears thin. Many people who drive probably experience getting stuck in traffic, especially if we are late for an appointment. That can be very trying. Or if you're driving behind a slow driver. Right? You may be on a, on a slide street here in Toronto, maybe even trying to get home. And you're used to going at 40 kilometers an hour at night on the side streets. And there's someone in front of you who's going 30 kilometers per hour. And already you're feeling yourself getting hot under the collar. Sometimes we have a hard time listening to people who are slow talkers. We sometimes want to finish their sentences for them. We interrupt. We don't want to have to wait until they finish their entire speech. This is certainly true for people that have speech difficulties. And it's very difficult to listen to them. And it requires a tremendous amount of patience. When you think about it, there are an infinite number of situations that we go through in our daily lives that try our patience. If you're living with someone that gets ready at a different speed than you do, if you're going out to an event, if you're going to a wedding, if you're going to a party, and you're ready and you have to wait, 5, 10, 15 minutes for your partner. Those 10 or 15 minutes can feel like two hours, can feel like two days. So these are all situations which are not once or twice in a lifetime. These kind of situations are literally every single day. If you're trying to make a phone call to get through to a company to speak to a representative of the company and you're put on hold and you have to listen to elevator music for a half hour or you're bumped back and forth between different uh, offices and transferred and you have to hold sometimes I found that to get customer service you might have to wait over a half hour to speak to the right person you may end up with someone from a different country who doesn't speak English that well. And it's very, very difficult not to lose your patience or to hold your patience. If you're going to the, take a flight at the airport and your flight is delayed, having to wait for a flight, again, especially if you're on a tight schedule, you can grow very anxious. You can get very impatient. If aggressive people on the street asking for handouts, anyone here who's been to Jerusalem, I know now it's changed. This doesn't happen at the Western Wall anymore. But there was a time when you went to the Western Wall in Jerusalem and it was hard to pray because you were being constantly asked for money, which is an important thing to do. But maybe there are times when you want to be uninterrupted. So it's important to actually go through this exercise and spend a few minutes and think about what are the things that trigger you. Each one of us is a little bit different. Each one of us, life circumstances is different. But it's important to be aware 
because there's, there's not going to be any way that we're going to have any chance of overcoming this, and we'll see, we'll examine why it's so negative. We're not going to have a chance to overcome this unless we're aware of our personal syndrome, of what kind of situations in our lives set us off. Parents probably have to pull their hair out at time because of their children that try their patience. Children who are not obeying what parents ask them to do. In any number of situations, they don't want to go to bed on time. They don't want to eat their food. I think I drove my mother crazy trying, when she was trying to feed me. I don't like it. I don't. <laughs> I ne you never tasted it. I don't like it. And I, I'm, I can't imagine my mother, her poor mother, for years and years and years had to try and get me to eat. So it's important, again, try to identify what are the situations that get us upset and try our patience. Now, what is the downside of impatience? What is the downside of becoming impatient and letting this wear on us? The truth is that as we go through our lives, we are often our own worst enemies. There's a, a wonderful parable that the rabbis tell in the Midrash on their comments to the book of Genesis, to Bereshit, where they describe the creation of the world and how after the creation, the trees come to God and they're very upset. The trees are screaming and they come to God and they say, we are very upset, we have a big complaint. And God says, what's the problem? And they say, we heard that you invented, that you created iron. Iron was created. And God says to them, so? What's the problem with iron? They say to him, iron? They're going to make axes with the iron and chop us down. The trees are very upset. So God says to the trees, you know, you're very foolish because it's only due to the fact that you allow your wood to be used for the axe handle that the iron is able to chop you down. Without the wood, an iron axe can't do anything. You have to have the handle in order to have some force behind the axe, behind the blade. And so I believe that one of the lessons that the rabbis are teaching in this midrash is that we often cause the harm to ourselves. Just like these trees were afraid of the metal, the metal really isn't the problem. The problem is going to be the wood. So we all know that stress, anxiety, uh, symptoms of impatience are simply painful. We find it painful, distressing, to have our patience tried. It's not a pleasant experience. And even when it's not a horrible situation, just sometimes having to wait is annoying. It's stressful. It's not a pleasant experience. It adds to our misery in life. We know, by the way, that being anxious and lacking patience doesn't make things move faster, as I've been told many times. It's not going to make things move faster if you lose patience. Also, when we become impatient, when we are impatient, it's impossible for us to ever learn. One of the things we're supposed to be doing in life is learning. And when we're impatient, we don't have a settled mind. And without a settled mind, it's not really that easy to learn or to accomplish anything. It's certainly difficult to teach if you're impatient. The Talmud says in Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers, that the impatient or irascible person cannot teach. It is certainly interferes with our relationships. 
It certainly causes stress and pressure on relationships when we are impatient with each other. One of the things that's the most problematic about impatience is that it can lead to worse things, like full-blown anger and rage. Usually, anger doesn't begin as anger. Very often, anger and rage has a genesis. It begins much earlier with losing one's patience. And so, it's a tremendous problem that needs to be nipped in the bud. One of the greatest problems with impatience is that it hurts our health. I read recently about the discovery of the type A personality. And it was discovered in a very interesting way. Some of you might know this story. There was a cardiologist's office. I think this may be back in the 50s. And they were noticing that the upholstered chairs in their waiting room were getting worn out very, very quickly. They were spending a fortune hiring an upholsterer to fix the chairs in their waiting room office. Waiting room. The fellow that was hired to fix the chairs told the doctors that he's noticing something that's strange about his chairs. He said that the chairs in the waiting room were only worn out on the very front of the seat. And the doctor realized these people are sitting literally at the edge of their seats. They can't even sit in the seat and just wait patiently for their appointment. These are people that are probably in the cardiologist's office because all the stress they're living with on a daily basis is causing them tremendous problems resulting in heart disease. So we can understand what are the downsides of being stressed and anxious and impatient. Spiritually, it's incredibly important to work on this. First of all, we've discussed in the past that one of the ways in which we nurture spirituality, in which we nurture a relationship with God, is by modeling our lives after God, by trying to live as God would live in a sense, by taking the example of God and running with that example. We're, dis we're told that God is infinitely patient with us. The Bible says God is erech long-suffering. He puts up with a tremendous amount. God is very slow to anger. Anyone that reads the Bible sees how much God put up with, with the Jewish people. The very important Kabbalistic book Tomer Devorah, the palm tree of Deborah, describes, based upon a passage in the book of Micha, God's nature, and says that God is so patient with us that even when we are rebelling against God, even when we are doing the worst things in the world in God's eyes, he still sustains us. He still gives us breath. He still gives us the ability for our limbs to move. The very limbs that are doing the wrong thing, that are angering him, he allows those limbs to move. If God did not want us to move or breathe, we wouldn't breathe, we wouldn't move. And so that demonstrates, according to Moshe Cordovero, who wrote the book Palm Tree of Deborah, the incredible extent of God's patience, that he tolerates us to an infinite degree. The Talmud tells incredible stories of patience from our sages. The tractate Eruvin, page 54b, talks about Rav Preda. Now, Rav Preda had a difficult student. The student was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I think they would say that when God was giving out brains and said, come forth, this fellow came fifth. And... Uh, Rav Preda was very, very patient with him. And the Talmud says that Rav Preda would teach him the same lesson 
400 times. That's how many times he'd have to repeat the same lesson over and over and over again. Now, it could be that the Talmud here is speaking in hyperbolic terms. Maybe it's just a way of saying he taught him so many times it would drive the average teacher crazy. But that's what we're told about Rav Preda, that he would have to teach this student 400 times until he finally understood the lesson. So the Talmud says that one time he taught him 400 times and the student didn't understand, even after 400 times. So Rav Preda said, what was the problem? What was different now that you didn't understand it? So what happened in this particular case was that as they were beginning their lesson, someone came by and said to Rav Preda that we're going to need you to do something important and maybe to sit on a bait in on a rabbinical court. But someone came in and interrupted the lesson and said, we're going to need you to uh, take part in something important. And the student said to Rav Preda that I wasn't able to focus and concentrate because I was nervous at any minute they were going to pull you out and I wouldn't be able to sit with you for the 400 times. So even though he had just taught this student 400 times and the student didn't get it, Rav Preda sat with him another 400 times until he got it. So the Talmud says, it's an amazing story, that as a result of this, he was visited by an angel, basically, who said to him, you have a choice. Either we're going to add 400 years to your life, or everyone in your generation will be uh, basically guaranteed a place in the world to come. So he said, I'll take what's behind door number two. He took the that everyone in the generation should be able to go to the world to come. And they said, well, we're going to give you both. Um, obviously, you have to think about whether to take the story literally, but the point of the story is very important. That here is someone that was so dedicated to the student that how long it took was not important. Even if he had to go over it and over it and over it again and again and again, he stuck with the student. Another famous story in the Talmud speaks about Hillel, the great sage Hillel. And he was someone that was famous for his patience and, his, and the difficulty to provoke him. So there were a few fellows that decided we're going to make a wager, and they wagered 400 zuz that they'd be able to get Hillel to lose his patience. So what did they do? They waited until Friday afternoon when everyone in the house is getting ready for Shabbat and people are cleaning and cooking, and people are going to shower, and they're bathing. So they waited until Hillel was in the bath, right before the Shabbat is to begin. And they knock on the door, they're knocking on the door, is Hillel here? Is someone named Hillel in this home? And he hears the knocking, and obviously someone needs him, so he gets out of the shower, and he puts on his bathrobe, and he runs down there probably with his hair wet, and he goes to the door. What is it? What is it? How can I help you? They say, oh, we have a very, very difficult question we need to ask you. He says, please ask my son. And they say, why do Babylonians have rounded heads? Why are the heads of Babylonians rounded? So Hillel says, that's a very good question. He says, the reason is, because their midwives are not very skilled. Oh, interesting. And they say, thank you. And he goes back to his house, probably gets his bathrobe off, back into the shower, gets his hair lathered up again, and then a few minutes later, Hillel, is Hillel there? Something very important, we have to ask you. So Hillel gets out of the shower again, and he puts on his bathrobe, and he runs down to the door. What is it, what is it, can I help you? He said, we have a very, another important, very important question. We can't, we can't live without this question being answered. You can imagine, what's the question? So they say to him, why do people from Palmyra have um, droopy eyes? Why are their eyes droopy? I think a normal person would have slammed the door, <laughs> maybe if they're lucky. Um, he says, you know, that's a very, very good question. He says, the reason is because they live in areas that are very sandy. So because there's so much sand flying around and so much dust, their eyes are maybe more closed than most people. Thank you very much. Goes back upstairs, 
probably back into the shower now, trying to finish. Shabbat is approaching. Another few minutes later, hello, hello, is hello there? Is hello there? We need to speak to him. Gets out of the shower a third time, puts on his robe, runs downstairs. What is it now? What is it now? It, and again, he's not saying in a gruff way, he's not aggravated. He says, my son, he even uses terms of endearment. My son, how can I help you? They say, we have another really, really important question. We cannot live without this one being answered. What's the question? They ask him, why do Africans, people from Africa, have wide feet? So he says, that's because they live in very swampy areas. So their feet have to be wider. So they say, are you really the man named Hillel? And he says, yes. And they say, well, may there be no other people in the world like you ever again. And he says, what, why not? Why? What's the problem? He said, because we lost 400 zuz because of you. We bet that we'd be able to get you angry and upset. And he says, you should lose many, many zuz, and I should never get angry, never lose my patience. One of the things that happens to us when our patience is being tried is we fear that our time is being wasted. Especially now, we're so overworked and we're multitasking and we're doing so many things and we can't get a moment's of rest. I think much more so than previous generations. We all thought that with the technology that we've invented, our lives would get easier, we'd be less busy, less stressed, and it's become the exact opposite. People are tethered to their technology. They always have to be on call. Constantly, they don't even have a time to leave their work. Their work often comes home with them. And so our time becomes very precious to us because we feel we don't have any time to ourselves. And when our time is being wasted, it's a cause of great aggravation. So when you think about it, in these instances, when our patience is being tried, because we feel that our time is being wasted, we remember that the Vilna Gon, of Elijah of Vilna, taught that the primary reason we were put into this world, the primary reason, not a third or a fourth or a fifth reason, the main reason we were put into this world was to work on perfecting our character traits. And so when our patience is being tried, and we have the impulse to say, they're wasting my time. They're wasting my time. Here come the Dudniks. Here come the Dre Cups. Here come the people that are just wasting my time. Another way of reframing that is, wow, I have an opportunity now to work on myself, to work on developing more patience. Because some people, they don't have a problem with this. For some people, they are so laid back, so laid back, nothing presses their buttons. And so for them, this is not part of their curriculum. It's not something they have to work on. But for most of us, our buttons are pressed, sometimes very easily. And so when that's happening, and we feel ourselves getting impatient, when we feel it coming on. And again, a big part of this is just to be aware of our feelings, to be aware of how we're feeling. And when we feel impatience coming on, to reframe it and don't jump to my time is being wasted, but to think about the fact that now we have an opportunity right in front of us now is a spiritual treadmill. It's a spiritual treadmill. And sometimes when we come home at night, we say to ourselves, I don't feel like going on the treadmill tonight. I'm tired. <laughs> I don't feel like it. On the other hand, there's a part of ourself that says, but it's good for you. It's good for you. Just do it. Just do it. Get on the treadmill and walk for an hour or a half hour, or whatever it's going to be. And so we often don't want to go on the treadmill a physical one or a spiritual one. 
And so at that moment when we feel our patience is being taxed and our time is being wasted, we should say to ourselves, what an opportunity I have now to get on a spiritual treadmill and to work on becoming more patient, to work on it, to use these situations where our patience is being tried as a tremendous opportunity, to use that time that we think is being wasted. The point of Vilna Gon is saying, no, your time is not being wasted. It's not being wasted. This is the most precious time in the world. This extra 10 minutes or 5 minutes or 2 minutes, whatever it is, you're going to be two minutes late to where you were going. You have to wait five minutes longer on the phone. Whatever the delay is, you could see it as a waste of your time, or you could see it as, wow, I could now do something for which I was put into this world. If I have a problem with patience, this is why I was put here, to overcome that and to work on that. It's really the best way to use our time. The Talmud calls impatience idolatry. When impatience leads to anger, the Talmud says that that is idolatry. Because what's happening is we're extending our ego into the world so far that we say, my time is being intruded upon. What I find convenient, what I think life should be like, how I think things should go. My view of the world becomes so preeminent that I overextend my ego into the world, that displaces God in some way. And so the rabbis say that whenever we overextend our ego into the world, that's a form of idol worship. And so one of the things that we're accomplishing by working on becoming more patient is that we're fulfilling the mitzvah, we're fulfilling the commandment of not worshiping idols. When you think about it, when it says in the Ten Commandments, don't worship idols, for most of us, we're not tempted to go and bow down to a statue. For many of us, we think that that commandment is irrelevant to our lives. Idolatry? Worshiping idols? I have nothing to do with that. that. That's like, forget about that. But the truth is, when we think about the fact that we overextend our egos into the world quite a bit, and so to work on not doing that is the fulfillment of the commandment not to worship idols. This becomes part of our service of God. One of the arenas in life where working on this character trait is extremely important is marriage. Marriage is just about the most critical arena where working on patience becomes so important. In Hebrew, marriage is called nisu'in. Nisu'in. The root word of nisu'in is nasa. Nasa can mean to carry to bear, to forbear, or put up with. That's what the word means. I don't think that the bride and groom were often told that under the marriage canopy, that they are now entering into a relationship where they have to carry and bear and forbear and put up with a lot. That's what it means. Because the other person is now part of my life. I can't just disregard them. And two people aren't always totally in sync. And so marriage often requires a tremendous amount of putting up with, putting up with the imperfections in our mate, or putting up with just the situations where our personalities are not in sync. Rabbi Shlomo Wolby says that if you do this, if you are able to put up with, and bear with, and forbear, then another meaning of the word nasa is actualized, because the root can also mean uplifted, to lift up. So when we successfully carry the burden 
put up with, bear, all meanings of the word nasa, if we do that successfully, we become uplifted. And the truth is the relationship becomes uplifted. The marriage becomes uplifted. And so does our spouse. We're told that the shell of an oyster will sometimes develop irritations. I don't know what that feels like. I don't have such a shell. But we're told that the oyster's shell will develop irritations. And the oyster doesn't like these irritations. But it can't get rid of them. Not able to get rid of these irritations. But what it does is it begins to settle down and it makes one of the most beautiful things in the world out of those irritations in its shell, which is a beautiful pearl. So the lesson for us, if we look at nature, is that we're able to transform many of the irritations in life into a pearl if we handle them with patience. The truth is that it takes a tremendous amount of effort to work on overcoming impatience. It's not easy. The, ta- the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, Sheva yipol tzaddik v'kam. Sheva yipol tzaddik v'kam. Seven times a righteous person will fall down, but they will get up. Seven times. A righteous person will fall, but they will get up. And Rav Yitzchak Hutner explained that there are two ways of understanding this verse. One way is not really the intended meaning. He says that you could understand the verse to be teaching that yes, the nature of a righteous person is such that when they fall, they will get up. That's one way that people understand the verse. But Rav Hutner says it doesn't mean that. He says what it means is that how did the person become righteous? It's through the process of having fall down seven times and have gotten up. Meaning, through these failures, through these uh, these situations where they fell down and they got up and they learned from it and they grew from it, these experiences of learning and growing from failures and mistakes is what uh, would allow someone to become a righteous person. So the battles we might have with our patients and impatience are worth it. Even though it's very difficult, it causes tremendous growth. We just lost one of our great Jewish singers, Leonard Cohen, who in one of his songs says that light comes in at the broken places. And so if in our lives, dealing with our patience and impatience is a situation where we become broken, because it's so painful and irritating, there's tremendous light that can come in specifically in those situations if we grow from them. So I want to speak for a few minutes about ways in which we can cultivate patience. What can we do to help overcome this tremendous problem that so many people deal with? So the first step I mentioned before is that there's a need, and this is not easy, there's a need to begin to recognize our feelings of impatience as they begin to arise. Usually what happens is we only catch ourselves after our blood is beginning to percolate a little bit. So that is a situation where it becomes much more difficult to stop because there it's almost like a car out of control. So it's much more important to be able to, and this is a skill that can be learned, to pay attention to ourselves and to be able to catch impatience at the very beginning. It's helpful to say to yourself, actually to do this, I'm feeling impatient. To catch the sensation at the beginning, let's say someone is not exactly on time, so not to catch it five minutes later when you're talking to yourself and maybe cursing them out, but five minutes earlier and say, I'm beginning to feel impatient. Or to say, that is impatience. To identify it, to label it. Now that's very powerful. Because when you label it or identify it, you're in control. 
What often happens is we're not aware of the fact that we're impatient. And it just cooks inside of us until it gets to the point where we can't control it anymore. It's like a runaway train. Because when the impatience leads to anger, which leads to rage, rage is going to be very difficult for you to pull back. But at the very, very beginning, when you're beginning to feel impatient, and you name it and identify it and say, I'm feeling impatient, you're in the driver's seat. And what happens is, when you're in the driver's seat, you have clarity. You have clarity. You're able to shine the light of clarity and knowledge. Your mind is able to take over. You're in control. And what happens is, when your mind is in control at this point, you have the ability to choose wisely. You have the ability to make wise choices, which are, which are guided by your values, which are guided by your goals in life, rather than your habits or instincts or emotions. That's what happens. Our life is often a battle between our mind and our hearts. And, unusual, and usually, if there's a battle between our mind and our heart, usually the heart wins. Our hearts are very, very powerful. Our emotions are very, very powerful. The, the challenge is, how do you stay in control? How do you stay in control where your emotions are not ruling you? Where you are ruling your emotions? And so the trick is to identify the battle at the beginning of the battle. Identify it quickly. And when you are able to label it and, and say, I'm feeling impatient. This is impatient that's coming up. You're able to choose. You're able to choose according to your mind. Rabbi Avraham ben Harambam, the son of Maimonides, suggests that one of the ways of battling impatience is to reflect, to meditate on how negative impatience is. To think about it. Again, it's using our minds to counteract our emotions. Possibly to study stories in the Bible where impatience leads to disastrous consequences. I'll share with you one such example. One of the most catastrophic events in Jewish history was the building of the golden calf not too many weeks after we came out of Egypt. Why did that happen? Because the Israelites expected Moses to come back at a certain time. And the Bible says that Moses was delayed. And they had a difficult time waiting. So that impatience, and it wasn't very long. It wasn't as if he came three or four days late. It was one day later than they expected. So because they weren't able to hold that uncomfortable feeling, they were so anxious and so stressed out and so impatient that his being delayed just for a day led to them building the golden calf. So the son of Maimonides says, think about the disastrous consequences of impatience. Study stories in the Bible. Think about how impatience has been destructive in our lives. Think about how it's put stress on relationships or sometimes ruined relationships because we're impatient. Think about its toll on our physical health, how it affects our blood pressure. We know the tremendous negative effects of stress and anxiety in life. It's not a minor problem, a minor health problem. Stress is a serious health problem. Think about and meditate on the value of the relationships that will be hurt by being impatient. Think about the importance of these relationships. Again, if our relationships are not important, then there's not such a downside to messing them up by being impatient. But if we think about it and really appreciate the tremendous value of our relationships that we don't want to sabotage, that's helpful. I mentioned before, thinking about the fact that being patient is a spiritual activity. It's a way in which we become closer to God. Think about the value of that. 
Think about the value of working on our personalities and overcoming negative character traits as one of the most important things we can do in life. There are so many benefits to being patient, so many downsides to being impatient. And finally, we would want people to be patient with us. What is the golden rule in Judaism? They asked, can you sum up all of Judaism while you're standing on one foot? This was asked to Hillel. I mentioned Hillel before. Someone wanted to convert to Judaism and said, teach me the whole Torah while I stand on one foot, which means I don't have much time. I can't stand on one foot for too long. Teach me the whole thing while I stand on one foot. And Hillel said, whatever annoys you, if something really ticks you off, don't do it to someone else. He said, that's the whole Torah. That's it. Everything else is commentary. Now go and learn it. I often have to think about this. For example, when I'm driving at night and I'm behind someone who's going slowly and I feel myself getting irritated and impatient, I have to say to myself, you know what? I've sometimes been in a neighborhood that I didn't know well. I've sometimes gone to a different city. I don't know the streets well. I have a hard time seeing the signs. And I might have to go slower than people who are living in these neighborhoods and drive on automatic pilot. They don't have to think. They can go very quickly. So when I find myself behind someone who I might immediately say, a drake up, a nudnik, why are they going so slowly? Give me a break. It's very easy to do that. And I catch myself and I say, I often find myself in the same situation. I'm not being a nudnik. I'm trying to see where I'm going. I'm looking for the number on a house. I don't know the neighborhood. I can't drive as quickly. So I say to myself, how do I feel when the person behind me is either tailgating or flashing their lights or honking? You can tell when someone is annoyed with you when you're driving. You can tell when they're upset that you're not going as fast as they want you to go. So I catch myself saying, I've been in that situation. I know what it feels like to express aggressiveness or express a desire that the person in front moves a little bit faster. I can't do it to someone else. It's important to realize that we all have the capability of being patient. We know that it's very easy to be patient if we're with an important person. If you can imagine that you're waiting for a meeting with the chief rabbi and you're sitting in a waiting area and the chief rabbi is five minutes late, you're not going to get all bent out of shape so quickly. If, you meet, if you're waiting to meet the president or CEO of a company, you'll be very patient because you're very happy to have that meeting. So we know that we all have the capability of being patient, of waiting, of Bearing the burden. We need to apply that same respect to all people. It's a very famous story. It's happened many, many times to different people. I heard it recently where there was a great rabbi who was the head of a rabbinical school and he wanted to meet with someone that might uh, ultimately donate to his rabbinical school. This was at a time when the, the schools in Europe were in very bad financial situations and he had a meeting with a very, very uh, successful, important businessman and the businessman was not told who the person waiting for him was. And he opened the door of his office and he looked outside and there is an older Jew there with a long black coat and a big hat and a beard and he thought it was another beggar and he was very rough with him and very dismissive. And the rabbi, you know, felt very bad this happened. And a few minutes later, the person came back out of his office 
and he was very, very uh, welcoming and respectful. And he says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was you. Someone obviously told him who this rabbi was in the office. And he was very, he, he, very deferential to the rabbi and very, felt, I felt very bad. And he says, I'm very happy I, I'm going to be able to you know, write a very large check to your school, your institution. He was going to give the rabbi a fortune. And the rabbi turned him down and said, I'm no different than the person that you dismissed as a beggar. We're all human beings. And you can't treat someone that you think is important differently. I don't deserve more respect than the beggar that comes to your office. And this rabbi, although his school needed the money, refused to take it from this person. So we have the ability to be patient with big people, with important people. We would not dare lose our patience if the CEO we're waiting for is five minutes late to our appointment. We're thrilled to wait for the five minutes. And so we have that capability. And if we extend the same honor and respect to all human beings who are created in God's image, we can extend that to all people. They tell a story about someone who bought a new car and he was driving the new car home. He was very happy that he had this new car and he stopped at a red light and the person behind him didn't stop in time and smacked him in the, in the back of his car. And the driver of this new car was furious and he puffs himself up and he opens the door of his new car and he walks over very, very aggressively to this person that hit the back of his new car and he was about to give him a piece of his mind and the other fellow opens the door of his car and steps out and he's like nine feet tall with muscles on top of his muscles and the person in the new car says, excuse me, I'm very sorry I stopped so quickly without giving you a chance to stop. I mean, he was able to, in one second, turn on a dime from being aggressive to being very deferential. We all have that capability. Another thing to bear in mind is that one of the things that we're here to do in this life is to do kindness to other people. Or Shlomo Karabach used to always say that one of the greatest lessons he ever learned was that the greatest thing that you can do in life is to do someone else a favor, to do kindness to other people. And so if we think about the fact that it's a huge kindness that we can do for people when we let others take their time. If someone is stammering, if someone stutters, don't interrupt them. Don't finish their sentence for them. Allow them to talk, even though it may be hard to put up with their slow speech. If people are slower than we want them to be, I spoke about this last week, to be able to accept what other people are able to do. We often don't want to accept what others are capable of doing. We have our own expectations. So it's a tremendous chesed, a tremendous act of kindness to let other people take their time, to be patient with them, and to help them relax, to help these people relax. I might have told the story the first week of this series of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter that on his last day of his life, he was basically the last day of his life, he was in a house, and there was someone who was assigned to be in the house with him because when the great rabbi would die, he shouldn't, be a, he shouldn't have a, a corpse in the house by itself. And so there was someone that was appointed that they're going to be in the house with the rabbi and to be able to watch the body overnight. And Rabbi Yisrael Salanter saw that this person was very agitated, very nervous, very upset, and he spent the last hours of his life reassuring him, it's okay, it's not bad to be alone with a corpse, you'll be all right. Now, Yisrael Salanter could have said, you think you have problems? <laughs> I'm on my deathbed. And you're just nervous about being with someone that's not alive anymore. But he didn't. He extended himself to do this kindness to someone else. A very important technique which I've tried and it really works, 
if we're feeling stressed and anxious and impatient, is to breathe serenely. To breathe. It's impossible, it is physically impossible, to feel anxious and impatient if you relax yourself physically. It's an incredible thing. If you relax yourself physically, it is not possible to feel anxious and impatient. So a powerful tool is to exhale. And when you exhale, to just feel the tension leaving. As you exhale, and and, and in your mind, think about the fact that you're exhaling and the tension is leaving your body. And when you inhale and you feel the the fresh oxygen coming in, let yourself relax. And as you're doing this, Repeat to yourself in your mind, actually in your mind say these words, patience as I breathe. Or you could have someone saying it to you. Imagine someone saying to you, patience as you breathe. Or if you're a fan of Seinfeld, serenity now, (laughs) serenity now. But to actually say words which are called affirmations, which are positive, say words of relaxation, and breathe. Some people practice deep breathing, where they inhale for a number of seconds, five, six, seven, eight seconds, and they hold the breath, and then they exhale. There are different ways of breathing, but if you breathe serenely, you actually stop to breathe. It's very difficult to be anxious and impatient. A very important thing to think about. Very important. The Talmud asks the question, who is the wise person? Who is the wise person? There are actually several answers that are given to this question. One of the answers is that the wise person is the one that can learn from everyone. But another answer that's given is, the wise person is the one who is able to foresee the future. Haroe es hanolad. The one who is able to look down and see what's about to happen. If we live our life with that in mind, if we anticipate, anticipate times when we might become impatient, to think about it, when we're about to embark on some activity, we're about to come home after a day of work, and you know that that's a time when it could be stressful, because everyone wants your attention, and maybe you just need to relax. Or in other situations, it's very easy, again, I mentioned at the very beginning tonight, think about the times that are your trigger points. Think about the times that are easy to set us off, to become impatient. And the wise person thinks ahead and tries to understand why is it that those times are stressful. For example, maybe I become impatient and stressed because I'm taking on too many things and I'm multitasking. Maybe by simplifying my life, my life will become less stressful. I won't have to try my patience as much. Another important thing, especially in our busy lives, is to build rest into our routine. Make sure that we get not just enough sleep at night, but to maybe take mini breaks during the day. Some people find it helpful to take a siesta, a nap. Some people just might get up from working and take a short walk. But there are many things that we can do to just break the incessant, constant stream of work and activity and pressure. Very important, because most stress in terms of anxiety and losing patience comes because of time issues. A waste of our time is being impinged upon. So another important thing in terms of looking down the pike and seeing what's ahead is not to procrastinate. We often procrastinate and push things off, and then we begin to run late, and we begin to have to rush. And when we're late and we're rushing, those are very prime times for being impatient. Don't put yourself in a position when you have to rush. 
when you could do things in life in a more relaxed way, in a calmer way, you're much less likely to become impatient than when you're rushing and you're late. Another technique that might be helpful is to always have something to do when you are delayed. I mentioned before that when your time is being delayed, when you have to wait, it's a great time to work on patience, a great time to work on that. But there may be other things. For example, you're at an airport and your flight is delayed. I've seen people sitting there in their seat for a half hour fuming and cursing and going up to the flight crew and screaming at them. I mean, it, it, there, there's road rage and there's airport rage. And the reality is that when you're delayed, you're delayed. You can't do anything about it. And so if you had something important to do at that time, bring something that you're able to work on. I mean, I know I never leave anywhere without a book. So I always have something I can study. So it may be frustrating not to be on your flight when the flight's supposed to leave, but if you say to yourself, okay, I have now an hour where I'll get a chance to do something that maybe I don't get a chance to do all the time. I don't often have time to study. I have now an uninterrupted time to be able to study or whatever else I can do in that period of time. If you remember the movie The Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi, who was the master teacher, he told Daniel, wax on, wax off. Right? Now, poor Daniel thought that this man was crazy. Right? He's coming to study karate, and this guy's teaching him how to wax a car. Wax on, wax off. And he only realized weeks later, he only realized weeks later that he was being taught the rudimentary movements of karate. He thought that his time was being wasted. He was angry at Mr. Miyagi. What is he giving me this ridiculous nonsense to do? Painting a fence. What is painting a fence? I didn't come to learn how to paint a fence. But the teacher, in an indirect way, was teaching him something that maybe he wouldn't have learned as easily. We all know that good education is where you help someone transfer something they know already to something that's new. So everyone knows about how to paint a fence. We all painted, waxing a car. He's probably done many times. Mr. Miyagi was only showing him that these motions that you've done before, if you practice them, that's the rudimentary movements of karate. God is the ultimate teacher. If you think Mr. Miyagi was a great teacher, the ultimate teacher is God. And because we all need to cultivate patience and trust that when God tests us, it's for a purpose, then we go through these experiences in life that we find annoying and we find irritating, it's for a purpose. We are being tested in order to help us grow. These are all tests that were designed for us to help us grow. A person on a very, very lofty spiritual level might even be thankful for these situations when their patience is being tested. Thank you, God, for putting me in a situation where I'm able to grow and develop. Nachmanides said, and taught that by learning to be patient, we're going to be able to save our lives. Because he says that one of the greatest sins is anger. If you think impatience is bad, anger is a hundred times worse. And he said that what we can do to prevent this spiraling out of control is to get into the habit of speaking softly and slowly. He didn't say that if you're in a tense situation. He didn't say that if you find yourself when your emotions are running high, don't raise your voice. 
That's what often people are told. Don't get so excited when you're upset. Don't start screaming. Ramban Nachmanani said, always speak, always, quietly and softly. Get into the habit. Build that muscle in your body so there's muscle memory so that if you are in a situation that's provocative, if you are in a situation which is about to drive you crazy, you're not going to end up raising your voice and screaming at someone and then letting it go to the next stage of anger and rage. It's one of the best ways of diffusing a tense situation. Because we know that one of the ways that fights get started is when emotions start running high and people raise their voices. And it's subtle sometimes. When you go from a normal conversational tone to a tone where you're expressing your anger just by raising the voice. So one of the most powerful ways of diffusing a hostile situation is to speak quietly and in a slower tone. Not to express yourself in a way where it looks like you're upset and it sounds like you're upset. And finally, one of the most powerful tools is to pray for patience. We pray for many things in life to actually say, God, please help me become more patient. And not just to do it when our patience is being tried. It's certainly a worthwhile thing to ask for every day. We don't have to wait until there's a, a, a catastrophe to pray for help. We don't need to wait until we're tried and our, our patience is really at a critical stage. Simply to ask God every day, look God, I know this is a difficult thing. I know that life is hard. I know that I'm often put in situations where my t t temper is being tested and my patience is being tested. Please help me control myself. Please help me think ahead and plan for situations that might test me so I can be better prepared. We can pray for many things in terms of our patience. In terms of exercises, there are a number of things that we can do as exercises. I mentioned most of them already tonight. I'm going to review. One is to train ourselves to become aware of the first moments that we're becoming impatient. So it's a thing that you might want to practice over the next week is to just be attentive, to be attentive to the moments during the day when your patience is being tested, when you feel yourself becoming impatient. Another thing that you may want to do, and this is a little bit more dangerous, is to put yourselves in situations that try your patience. <laughs> um, let's give an example. There may be someone in your life that you avoid because when you have interactions with them, it's trying. Now, I think all of us probably have people in our lives that we should be in touch with more than we are. Communication today is often um, reduced to texting people or emailing people. Um, I would say that's not the platform, that's not the arena where we're able to practice this so easily. I'm talking about either a conversation on the phone or a live face-to-face -face conversation. But as a practice, if you want to do something to practice exercising patience, is maybe identify someone that, I'm not talking about a complete stranger, someone in your life that you might normally call, but you maybe not call as often as you could. Someone that, when you speak to them, you find that your patience is being tried. Let's say they tend to take the conversation and not let you get a word in edgewise. Right? We know there are many people in our lives that can try our patience for many reasons. They may end up spending the half hour with you complaining about their lives, um, not letting you get a word in edgewise. There could be any number of things. Let's say that you're sensitive to gossip. They may very easily spend a half hour gossiping. So I'm sure each of us can identify someone like this in our lives. It may be helpful to us to give them a call once a week, once a month, and practice being patient. 
practice being patient. By the way, it doesn't only have a powerful effect on ourselves when we're patient. It has a powerful effect on other people as well. And finally, uh, as an important exercise, to contemplate, to think about what are the times in my life, what are the situations that tend to be provocative to me? Is it that first five minutes when I come home to my family after a full day of work? Um, Is it when I have to speak to certain people? It's when I do certain activities? It could be that some people are simply aggravated and stressed out on technology, having to deal with a computer that, right, that they can't figure out. Right? There, there, there is a, a large menu, a large menu of things that, that provoke us and they get us aggravated and we are tried, our patience is tried. So to purposely choose one of those activities put ourselves in a situation where our patience is going to be tried and try to control that, pa- that impatience. So it's, a, I would say, one of the most important areas of our life to work on. I think for most people, uh, this is not an, an easy test, not an easy trial, but I think that all of us recognize that probably if there's something that we can improve upon, this would really, really change our lives in, in a tremendously Um, important and positive way.